And for those of you who would uh, like the opportunity, uh, Ken and Teresa will be here this morning. And you can probably catch them in the fellowship hall in between services. I want to know what you had for breakfast this morning. You didn't have breakfast? Oh, a show of hands, who had breakfast of champions? Wheaties? No Wheaties. Any kind of cereal? Okay. Any egg product? French toast, pancakes, waffles, one. Well, very good. You got two. Fruit. Fruit, very good. Very good. Well, I didn't have anything at all. I don't generally eat breakfast on Sunday morning which uh, is, I think it's obvious that I don't miss many meals. <clears throat> I have sometimes been working on something and forgot to eat, but generally speaking, I am pretty sure that I show up uh, when there's food around. Uh, I say sometimes that I am a social drinker. I Generally speaking, don't drink coffee unless I'm with people. And uh, when I am with people, like men's breakfast, I can drink six cups and not even know how. I mean, they fill it up and I drink it. And I'm a social eater. I eat whatever's in front of me. I eat all of it, basically. And uh, enjoy it greatly. Well, where were we? Oh. John 15, you remember this story. I am the vine, you are the branches. Take care to live in me. This is uh, the living Bible. Take care to live in me and let me live in you. That's the abide in me and I will abide in you. Take care to live in me, let me live in you. A branch can't produce fruit when it's severed from the vine, nor can you be fruitful apart from me. Uh, Becky's added to our display this morning some dead branches. No life in them at all. They are severed from the vine. So there they are, dead as a doornail, doing nothing. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him shall produce a large crop of fruit. For apart from me, you can't do a thing. I like that fresh, no-nonsense uh, wording. You can't do a thing. Last week, we talked about this intimate and close relationship that Jesus is describing between himself and his Father, that he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. He is in the Father, the Father is in him, because Jesus lives no life of his own. He has no life apart from the Father. He lives the life of the Father. He obeys the Father. He loves the Father. He does what pleases the Father. He does what the Father tells him to do. And so, he and the Father are one. They live in this close relationship. Jesus was saying that his total life came from the Father. And then about the vine, he says the same thing. That here's the vine, here are the branches. And I'm that vine, and you are those branches. And your life comes from this vine. The branches have no life separate. They have no life of their own. They can't decide to just climb off and go have fun or do this or that or the other thing. They are connected and that's where their life comes from. That's what gives them the nutrients they need. 
That's what gives them the food they need to sustain life. That's what it gives them everything they need to produce fruit, the very purpose of their being. This is the physical growth cycle. Our physical bodies are exactly the same way. We have to eat. Well, I guess you don't have to, but it works better when we do. That our bodies, in fact, require food. We have to eat and drink to grow and maintain life, to get the nutrients that we need. God created us with a thirst and a hunger so that we would know when we need food. We would, we would know this before we passed out. Uh, from weakness or faint uh, due to lack of hydration. God built this in. Well, the truth is that in America, we're mostly obsessed with food. I don't know, does anybody here watch the Food Channel? One, two, three are willing to admit this. On Facebook, if you're on Facebook at all, you're looking at food. People post food. They post what they're eating at the moment. They post what they'd like to eat. They post what they're making. Food. Everywhere. We watch the commercials on TV and drool as they look so good. Some people actually confess out loud that they spend a lot of hours every day thinking about food. But that wouldn't be anybody here. Food is a part of our life. It is necessary. It is important. And we love food. I, in all my years, and I'm all the way up to 74 now. But in all my years, I have never, ever heard anyone say, you know, food is just so boring, and it just, it's so yesterday, and I think I'm just going to give it up, say, till fall, or maybe next year. No. We are well aware that we need to eat. Most of you have already given some thought today for what you're going to have for lunch or for dinner today. It's that important to us. And Jesus uses this illustration of the vine and the branches to remind us that in a spiritual sense, we need food every day. I'm the vine. You're the branches. The branches must receive the sap, must receive the life, the nutrients, all that the vine is feeding it. It needs it every day. It can't go without this. This is essential to life itself. Without spiritual food, we shrivel, we, we get weak, we can't function, we can't focus. In the very same way, that happens to us if we don't eat physically. Well, you remember that John 14, 15, 16, we're calling this Jesus' last lecture. And in John 14, uh, Jesus is trying to reassure them as they understand that he's talking about leaving. He's talking about dying. And they just don't see how this, get, they, they don't get it. How could this possibly be happening. And you remember we've talked quite a bit about this physical versus spiritual disconnect that's happening. Because they had expected a physical Messiah King who would rule over Israel and restore the glory of Israel and the independence of Israel. And what they get is a king willing to die, a suffering servant who doesn't talk at all like they expect him to talk. He's speaking of a spiritual kingdom. 
You remember we talked about Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and saying you must be born again, and he doesn't understand this. How, how can you climb back into your mother's womb to be born again? And Jesus explains that flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Where there's a physical thing happening, there's a spiritual component that's an important part of that. Oh, now Jesus is talking about this vine and the branches and, and the need for the branch to stay connected so it can be fed. It can receive what it needs. We think clear back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry where there he is in the wilderness being tempted by the, by the devil. And he has fasted for 40 days. And the devil comes to him and says, you can turn these stones into bread and eat. Thinking, trying to entice Jesus with the physical need to eat. And Jesus' response from scripture is so poignant at this point because he simply says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Physical food would have filled his stomach, would have quenched his hunger for a time. But there's something more important than the physical food. It is the spiritual food that feeds him every word from God. And so he makes again this distinction between the physical. I wonder how they thought when Jesus said this, or when he told them the story of it. Because man does not live by bread alone. And I'd say, you got that straight. I mean, ice cream's important too. And barbecue, anything barbecued, you can think of all kinds of things. But of course, we understand that the reason he's using the word bread is because that bread is used as a synonym for physical food, all food. So we have some bread here on the table <coughs> this morning to remind us that we need food. <coughs> we need that which sustains our spirit as well as our physical body. Uh, bread is made all over the world. Uh, all kinds of bread. I brought some pictures Oh, you've been looking at one already. That's bread, would you believe? Uh, these pictures were taken in Santa Fe, New Mexico on our trip there in the spring. And uh, I hope it's making you hungry. I mean, marvelous different kinds of breads, all sorts of breads, different flavors of breads. Uh, Wow, makes me hungry. <clears throat> Where we lived in Bolivia and Peru, <clears throat> every village had their own style and shape of bread. So we had huli bread and puno bread, and each, each place had its own bread. We'd send the kids up to the plaza to get us a bag of bread. Uh, marvelous bread. Uh, made in, in uh, earthen ovens. <clears throat> bread. And Jesus says, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that God speaks to us. In John chapter 6 is a portion of scripture that w is widely known as the bread of life discourse. And Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and they were all filled and they collected 12 baskets left over having started with just five loaves and two fish. And he fed them all. And then Jesus goes across the lake and they come looking for him and they find him and he says to them, in John 6, 26, 
I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus, skipping down just a bit, Jesus said to them, uh, because they were claiming, you know, we want you to do some miraculous signs. And they said, well, Moses, he gave us manna in the desert. Moses gave us food to eat, physical food. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, from now on, give us this bread. That's what we want. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate that manna in the desert, and yet they die. But here's a bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread. Well, this is where you remember Jesus goes on and tells them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. you see the mixture of the physical and the spiritual. Oh, they're greatly offended. This is too hard for them, and so the crowd leaves. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, what about you, are you leaving too? And they say, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then Jesus explains to them, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Our da granddaughter, Natasha, never showed much interest in playing with dolls when she was little. She did have a marvelous imagination and loved to spin stories and never stops talking. That's true even now. She calls us every week and an hour, two, you never know. But she doesn't slow down much. <coughs> well, Louise asked her once why she didn't like dolls. And she said, they don't do nothing. Well, Natasha didn't see much good in dolls, but the truth about her is that she had dozens of other stuffed animals and a wonderful imagination. And she named her animals and she created life for them. And she took them on amazing adventures. And they did wonderful things together and had incredible relationships with each other. We could say that she gave them identity and life through her words to them as she related their story, which, when you think about it, is exactly what Jesus is talking about in the vine and the branches. Jesus' words feed us. And in his words, he names us. He says to us, you are loved. You are forgiven. You are my child. You are clean. With his words, he pronounces cleansing and forgiveness and healing and love to us. He creates in us a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart after God's own heart. We are changed by listening to the words of God 
and putting them into practice. Man does not live by bread alone, but by everything God says to us every day. The Word of God is living and active, Paul writes, and penetrates to the deepest places, to the places of our deepest need. And the Word of God is spirit, and they are life for us. So the vine and the branches again, notice what Jesus says next. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, if you don't climb off and go dead like that, if you stay connected, <clears throat> you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers, loses its life. <clears throat> if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish. It'll be given. This is my Father's glory. You will bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my disciples. Anybody here ever heard the story Charlotte's Web? Everybody knows Charlotte's Web. There's a marvelous song in the movie where Wilbur, has the pig, has discovered that he can talk. And so he sings this song which the major part of the song, you got it, I know you do, is about this pig who can actually, factually talk. All through history, people have felt like God is far away and hard to get to know. People have created religions, philosophies, all kinds of ways to explain God. But it turns out that the true God actually, factually talks. He has from the beginning the very first word spoken in the Bible is in Genesis 1 verse 3 where God says, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke the worlds into being. God spoke to Noah, said there's going to be a flood, build a boat. Spoke to Abraham, pack up, you're going on a journey. By the way, I want a relationship with you. We're going to form a covenant, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush and sent him to Egypt to let my people go. The Bible is full of these stories of what happened when God spoke. In Hebrews chapter 1, we're told that in the past, God spoke to the forefathers through the prophets in many different kinds of ways. But now, he speaks to us through his son Jesus, who is the exact representation of the Father. When Jesus spoke, things happened. He said to the storm, be still. And it was, he told the invalid, pick up your bed and walk, and he did. He told the demons to get out, and they went. He told the dead and buried Lazarus to come forth, and guess what? He did. So Jesus says to us, whoever hears these words of mine, whoever hears the words that come from the mouth of God, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. You remember Jesus talking to the woman at the well in John 4. And that's an amazing story all by itself. But the disciples have gone off to get food, probably checking McDonald's or Burger King. I'm not sure. But anyway, they come back. And when they come back, they have food, and so they say to Jesus, Rabbi, eat. You, you need to eat something. And he says to them, 
I have food that you know not of. And they're scratching their heads. In fact, they even ask the question, did somebody bring him some food? They're thinking physical, physical, physical. But Jesus says, my food is to do the will of my Father. My food, this is food, this is life. This is the vine and the branches. This is that we receive what we need because we're being fed. This is our food to love God and to do what he says, to listen for his voice. You remember the story of Mary and Martha. Uh, Mary sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he's saying, listening to him, what he said. And Martha, distracted by all the work that needs to be done, the preparations, and she comes and says, Lord, my sister's leaving all this work for me. Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things, physical, stuff going on. But Mary has chosen what is needed. She has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Yeah, the preparing the physical meal, it'll always be there. It always will need to be done. But to sit at the feet of Jesus and to receive the spiritual food we need, that is the essential thing we need. In the middle of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, he says, give us this day our daily bread. I hope that after listening to this message, you don't really think he was talking about sourdough or wheat. Isn't it obvious, so plain, that we are to pray, Lord, give us today the words from the mouth of God that we need to sustain us. Give us today all we need for life. Speak into our needs. Speak into our thoughts, into our hearts, into our situation. The words that will sustain us and give us all that we need to be your followers. Would you pray with me? Lord, today we pray this prayer. Give us today, Lord, our daily bread. What you gave us three years ago or 20 years ago is a good memory, but we need today's food today. We need to hear the words of God that will sustain us on the vine, that will give us the food that we need. May your words remain in us. Help us to put into practice what you say to us. May the word of God dwell richly in each one of us. We so desperately need the food that you have for us. More importantly than what we will have for lunch or dinner or breakfast tomorrow. We need the food that endures, that comes from your mouth to us. We bring you now, Lord, an offering and ask you to bless this. Use it for your glory, Lord, to accomplish the needs of ministry in this place and beyond. We love you. We thank you for the food that you give us each day. In your name we pray. Amen. Would our ushers come for the offering?